Well, good morning, everyone. Reverend Catherine Bonin here filling in for, with today's inspirational message for our dear friend, Reverend Larry Heil, who is in Oregon with her family. It's my honor to deliver this morning's message and uh, talk about beginnings. Here we are, the first part of January, always a good time to think about beginnings. But first, a little story. A sweet little boy surprised his grandmother one morning and brought her a cup of coffee in bed. He had made it himself and he was quite proud. So he anxiously waited there by the foot of her bed as she drank the coffee, waiting for the verdict. Well, the grandmother had never had such a horrible cup of coffee in her life, but she wasn't about to tell her sweet grandson. So she gulped it down and when she got to the bottom, she noticed that there were three little army guys in the bottom of the cup. And she said, sweetheart, why are there three little army guys in the bottom of my coffee cup? And her grandson replied, you know, Grandma, just like on TV, the best part of waking up is soldiers in your cup. So this is how this grandmother and grandson started their morning. How do you start your day? Do you get up and hit the snooze button? Think, oh, I'm so tired. Do you jump up and get a cup of coffee? When I was in college, I had a roommate who used to jump up and down on her bed, shouting, it's going to be a great day. What's your morning routine? Did your mother teach you to make your bed? And did you, or did you rebel? If you're like me, you might have quit making your bed when you were in college and didn't have anybody prodding you. In her book, The Happiness Dare, Jennifer Dukes Lee says making your bed is a really big deal. I really resonated with what she said because she talked about how as a child, her mother used to insist that she made her bed and she just didn't see the sense in it, but she did what she was told. Then when she left for college, she stopped. None of us ever did that, right? Well, I think I already tattled on myself and told you that I did, but I remember actually thinking that making my bed was a waste of time, seeing how I'd just be undoing it anyway that night. Now, that doesn't mean that I never made my bed. I made it when I was expecting company, and I enthusiastically made it after I bought a very expensive brand new bedding set. That lasted, well, a week or two. And somewhere along the way, though, I stopped not making my bed, and I started making my bed. And as I thought about this talk, I thought, when was that and what changed? And I think what happened was I changed. And this morning, just like every morning for the past 30 some odd years, I made my bed. Several years ago, U.S. Navy Admiral William McRaven gave a commencement speech at the University of Texas in Austin. And in that speech, he said, every morning in basic training, our instructors would show up at the barracks room and the first thing they did was inspect everyone's bed. If you make your bed every day, he said, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It'll give you a small sense of satisfaction and it will encourage you to do another task and then another task and then another. And by the end of the day, that one task will have cascaded into many tasks successfully completed. It sets the tone for the whole day. Making your bed, he said, reinforces the fact that the little things in life matter. They make a difference. And if you can't do the little things right, you'll never ever get the big things right. And then he said, if by chance you had a miserable day, at least you'll come home to a bed that's made. And in her book, You Can Create an Exceptional Life, Louise Hay recommends starting your day off with gratitude. She says, it took me some time at first, but then it became automatic. It became a habit and I loved it. Her first thought of the day was gratitude for the new day and all of the good that the new day held. Then she would get up, turn around, and begin making her bed. And she would say, good morning, bed. Thank you for being so comfortable. Thank you for providing me with such a good night's sleep. I love you. And through conscious effort, Louise made that a habit. Now, the Greek philosopher Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. Let me say that again. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. 
simple act of making your bed might be the world's easiest success habit, not because it brings good fortune or fame, but because it starts a chain reaction of other productive, successful habits. Do you remember when you were a child and loved to watch Mary Poppins? And do you remember the scene in Mary Poppins where she, unbeknownst to most of us, also quoted Aristotle? She said, well begun is half done. And in that scene, she got the children to start cleaning their room. When she snapped her fingers, the bed made itself and the toys started flying all around the room, putting themselves away. The idea there is that tasks looked at through a different lens can be a game. They can actually be fun. If you've ever gone to a cooking class or gone to cooking school, you learn about mise en place, which is a French phrase that means putting in place. The principle here is that a chef's kitchen or workstation and its condition, its state of readiness, if you will, is an extension of the chef's own nervous system. The universe is in order when your station is set, says Chef Anthony Bourdain. The single most important ingredient of any dish is being prepared. So you see, if we start each morning preparing for the day, we can literally create the day that we want to experience. Like a master chef, we set ourselves up for success. When I was small, my mother used to make cookie dough when we were at school. She would make cookie dough rolls, long rolls, and wrap them in wax paper, and then she'd put them in the freezer and some in the refrigerator. And every morning, she would get up at four o'clock to see my father off to work just before five, and then she would make a couple dozen cookies. We each had an alarm clock, and we were not allowed to come out of our room until the alarm went off at 6.30. We could smell the cookies, and we knew that there'd be fresh cookies in our lunch in fact, we often had fun guessing, would they be oatmeal raisin or peanut butter or chocolate chip? And once when I was about seven, I defied the rule and went downstairs only to discover my mom sitting at the dining room table with warm cookies and her hot cup of coffee. She was dunking those cookies in her coffee. Well, she allowed me to sit down with her and have a cookie as she told me that this was a special day. She was going to let me sit with her this day, but never again, that I really needed to honor that 630 rule. And I couldn't come downstairs until my alarm went off because this was her quiet time. And we all needed to stay in our rooms until the alarm went off because she needed that quiet time. And, you know, looking back with five kids, I get it. She deserved it. And this was her personal form of spiritual practice. In Richard Living, Ernest Holmes says to us, communion with the spirit is one of the greatest privileges of life. When we commune with God, we do not tell the infinite what to do or how to do it, for that is talking at God rather than communing with him. By communion, we mean silently entering into divine harmony and beauty until we feel that harmony and beauty in our souls and in our minds. And then, and only then, do we see it out picturing in our lives? That's spiritual practice, communing with the divine, creating time to do that. And there's something to be said about that. For me, as a result of creating time for spiritual practice after I make my bed, life seems to work better. Problems don't seem to be as big or as horrible. And I seem to experience a deeper level of joy and satisfaction in my everyday life. And if your mother's guidance to make your bed or my mother's guidance or the idea of mise en place, the cookie story or the words of Ernest Holmes aren't enough, well, let's look at the master teacher, Jesus. Do you remember that little bit in scripture about the resurrection and after the resurrection? In fact, I think it says in the early morning before the sun came up, the women went to the tomb with oils and spices. And there they found the stone had been rolled away. And they found the linen cloth had been folded neatly in the tomb. You know what that means? That means that Jesus made his bed. And then in Mark 135, we read, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. 
And later in that same chapter in Mark 4, the Bible tells us that Jesus always awoke before dawn because he wanted to avoid the distractions that came from the busyness of the world, from people and events and tasks and duties. Then later in John 15, verses 5 to 7, we're told, seek the kingdom of God first. And this, for me, is about how we set our, our mind, our emotions, and our behavioral direction in the beginning of every day. See, Jesus not only prayed to commune with the Father within, he prayed for personal guidance. He also prayed for others. This was his spiritual practice. And I love that it says he did it first thing in the morning when things were quiet and the world hadn't got, gotten spinning yet. He had specific prayers for people and situations, and he prayed that people would be filled with spiritual wisdom and with understanding. He affirmed that God gave man eyes to see the good that is already here, and he praised and acknowledged the many attributes of God, qualities like wisdom and love and peace and wholeness and joy, the very qualities that we align with when we do spiritual mind treatment. So by setting an intention to make your bed, and then by creating time to commune with spirit, you're setting yourself up for success and a day filled with connection. And what could be better than that? Now, you know, goals and priorities are really important, but there's something much more important than that. The process that gets you there. If you are going to do something, no matter what it is, do it to the best of your ability. The Talmud, the Jewish book of law, tells us that the way a person does one thing is the way they do everything. Sometimes we all cut corners. I just bought a book called Semi-Homemade Chicken Dinners. It's 100 great recipes that start with a store-bought rotisserie chicken. Now, is that cheating? Personally, I don't think so. But that's a decision that each of us have to make. Am I rushing through? Or am I choosing to do things a different way? Am I doing it consciously with intention? It's what, what's really important is for us to pay attention to when we're taking shortcuts versus when we're neglecting to do the really important stuff. If we try to do everything perfect, we're going to get burnt out, and we're going to get burnt out really fast. So it's really important for us to find that place of balance. A few years ago, when I was still working full time, I had a job that required me to go into an office every single day for about five months. It was a large company that the company I was working for was merging with, and they had 20 or 21 buildings that were quite sp spread out with a lot of green space. And there were always people outside hanging around, having meetings at small tables, eating lunch under trees, even playing Frisbee. And I remember thinking one could even mistake this place for a college campus. Well, one afternoon around six o'clock, as I was leaving for the day, I saw a man walking across a line that he had tied between two trees, and it was about a foot off the ground. My first thought was, oh, he's trying to teach himself how to walk a tightrope. You know, you start low with a wide band, master that and change the belt for a rope and, and then go further and further. And I stood there and I watched him and he made it about 10 feet before he fell down. But then he got right back up and started up again. He noticed me watching him. And after a few minutes, he asked if I wanted to try. And he explained to me that this was called a slack line. It's actually a competitive sport, he told me. He was just starting. And um, he told me that a good friend of his had just walked across a slack line 200 feet above the ground in Yosemite, that it just takes practice and perseverance. He asked if I wanted to give it a try. Yeah, I thought, right. But then I thought, well, wait a minute, why not? It's a three inch wide band and it's only one foot off the ground. What's the worst thing that could happen? So I took off my shoes and he helped me up. I stood on the end of the strap and I focused intently on the tree that the end of the line was tied to. I focused on making it to the other side and I visualized reaching that tree and then powerfully with laser focus I affirmed I easily make it to that tree but still I was scared. I took my first step and guess what I fell right down 
Then he said, imagine you're successfully walking across the slack line. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm successfully walking across this line. In fact, I'm not actually walking, I'm playing. I'm enjoying it, it's easy and it's fun. Kind of like when I walked the balance beam when I was in high school and won all those ribbons and trophies. I'm walking, I'm skipping, I'm taking little hops, I'm even doing cartwheels, I declared. And he said, and who are you being? I'm being me, accomplished, successful, fun-loving, playful, laid on my feet, happy and joyful, I said with a smile. He smiled back and nodded at me. And he said, all right, start again. So I took off again, focusing on the tree across the way, and I fell again. But this time, I had made it about three feet across. Ready to try again, he asked me. Close your eyes and visualize yourself making it all the way across. Don't worry about falling, he said. That's just part of the process. And if you think about it, what's the worst thing that could happen? What have you got to lose? Well, you know, I had just thought those same thoughts a few minutes earlier. And suddenly, I felt myself being verklempt. I felt my eyes welling up with tears. What's the worst that could happen? Well, I could break something. What have I got to lose? I don't know, but there's something else going on here. Something deeper, I thought to myself. My throat got all tight, and I had to take some breaths. If I fall off, I said, I'll have to go to the beginning and start all over again. And suddenly, I could see the link between all of my fears, all the fears I held in life and the way I was doing that slack line. My greatest fear was that I would fall off and fail. And that would mean that I'd have to start all over again. And that had nothing to do with the slack line. And then suddenly I got it. Somewhere in life, I had decided that success meant you went the whole way without ever falling down or ever needing to start over again. And in that moment, it became clear to me that the end wasn't ever the goal. Reaching the furthest point doesn't matter. I whispered to myself, this is about how I do it. It's about the way I enjoy and play and interact and embrace the relationship I have with what it is that I'm doing. That's what matters. The slack line is just a metaphor for life. It's just a metaphor for my life. And the tears continued to roll down my fa face as I looked at the young man and I said, this is about the journey. This is not about the destination. And I realized that when I focused so hard on getting there, wherever there was, I wasn't enjoying the ride. So I wiped the tears and I took a deep breath and I heard the words in my heart, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. I smiled and I walked back over to the end of the slack line. I put one hand on the tree and I stepped up again. And this time it felt different. I really didn't care if I made it to the end. I was gonna walk as far as I could, one foot above the ground. This time would be fun. I would make it a dance. I was in it for the dance, the dance between myself, my footsteps, and that line, that three inch line, that line that suspended me and held me in the air. Falling off didn't matter because it was part of the dance. See, I was one with the game. I was having fun and the game was one with me. Then I walked halfway across the flat slack line, just like that, but then I fell. And I laughed because this time when I fell, it was fine, it was even fun. And I got the lesson. I thanked my new friend and gave him a hug. And every other time I walked past those two trees, I looked for him, but I never saw him again. He was truly a blessing to me. Do you? Understand how you do one thing, the ideas and the beliefs that you hold behind what it is that you do? Do you know that the fears, the beliefs, the hopes, dreams that drive you as you set out to walk that rope of life each day determine how the day goes? Do you rush through things? Do you eat fast? Do you rush through parenting, through work, through a workout, through a novel, or through time spent in a relationship? Are you sometimes preoccupied with the destination instead of the journey? If the way you do one thing is the way you do everything, 
I'd like you to think about how you're living your life right now. See, the idea is that every moment of life is a microcosm of the life we live as a whole. The simple things we do can give insight into our emotions or into life's challenges. Simple things like the way you get out of bed, the way you wash dishes, or even the way you breathe. The real world consists of real things. There are rocks and ants and people like you and me. These real things all live in the real world, regardless of whether we see them or not. But when we look at a rock or an ant or a person or a situation, we do something really interesting. We actually give it meaning. We dress up this real exists outside of ourself thing and we paint our inner emotional world onto it. We give it our own meaning. Everything we look at, we see through a filter of our own experiences, our own beliefs, our own fears. And we are quite selective in what we see. How many times have you walked by something or someone and not even seen it? See, we see through these filters and those filters color our world. If you think about it, they're essential to our health and well-being, just as essential as vitamins or minerals. Because the world is packed with things to see, things to hear, things to taste, to touch and to feel. So we're selective about what we notice, what we pay attention to. If we didn't, we'd go crazy. We'd experience sensory overload. I have a friend who has an autistic son and she tells me that's what his experience is like. Always sensory overload. Jill Bolt Taylor, the neuroscientist who documented her stroke in the New York Times bestseller called My Stroke of Insight, talks about this same idea. She says, each of our sensory systems is made up of a complete cascade of neurons that process the incoming neural code from the level of the receptor to specific areas within our brain. Each group of neurons along the cascade alters or enhances the code and passes it on to the next set of cells in the system, which further define and refine the message. By the time the code reaches the outermost portion of our brain, the higher levels of our cerebral cortex, we become conscious of the stimulation and we begin to have an experience which is shaped by our thoughts and our beliefs. If any of the cells along the pathway fail in their ability to function normally, then the perception is skewed and one might experience more stimulation than they can handle. And so this the real world we live in really isn't the real world. It's the real world seen through filters, and these filters are a result of our thoughts and our experiences and our beliefs. What we experience is a world that's manufactured by our subconscious to support our conscious life. If we pay attention to the way that we do things, like how we start our day or how we wash dishes, for example, we might see that we have a desire and a tendency to rush things and do them too quickly. To just get it done and not be in the experience, to not enjoy the present of the present moment. We pay attention to the way we breathe. We can see our own stress and our own tension. When we find the moments we breathe most freely, we find our personal bliss. And when we find the moments where we're holding our breath, we find our fears and our frustrations, and our disappointments. How you handle and manage any situation, any challenge or experience in your life, is probably how you handle all of them. How do you perform at work? What are your friendships like? How do you approach a challenge or a problem? If you're late with a deadline and don't pay close attention to detail, then the chances are that these characteristics can be seen in your personal life and in your relationship as well. If you often find yourself having conflict with friends or family members, you'll probably find that there's conflict in other areas of your life as well. And that's because we don't live a whole bunch of mini lives. We live one life. We aren't split. We're not a whole bunch of little pieces. We are one whole being. And we can't drop the ball in one area of our life and expect the other areas to function smoothly. When I procrastinate, 
I tend to get myself into a frenzy to complete a project, and then I'm exhausted. I have nothing to give the people I love, much less myself, and I find that I'm out of balance. And then I'm crabby and testy. You never feel that way, do you? <laughs> you see, the habits we practice in one area of our life become our life. Let's pretend for a moment that I'm standing in your house. I'll take a moment and open your closet door. Are there a bunch of clothes in there that you never wear but continue to hold on to just in case? What does your garage look like? Do you have a pile of to-dos on your desk? Are there people in your life that don't match up with who you are and who you want to be? Why are you still connected with those people? Is there some area in your life that you know could be better, but find yourself just settling for the way it is? Let's face it, none of us are perfect, but the little ways we drop the ball in life are going to add up and they're going to affect the other areas. And it's true. The way we do anything is the way we do everything. And that doesn't have to be bad news. It can be good news too. The way we do anything is the way we do everything. So the, if we can make small conscious changes in one area of our life, we can affect the other areas like those neurons that cascade and fire as they make their way to the edges of our brain, or like the wings of a butterfly that can start a tsunami on the other side of the world. So here's your assignment for this week. Set an intention to begin each day a little differently. Start with something that will set you up for success. Making your bed is a good one, and it's also a metaphor. So if you also already make your bed, then perhaps you'll sit up and meditate. Maybe you decide to take a short walk every morning before you have your coffee. Maybe you sit with your coffee or tea on the patio and just listen to the birds. Perhaps you want to write morning pages or listen to soft music. Maybe you want to read. Whatever it is that gets your day started on a positive note, that's what you want to do. That's what you want to make a habit. Because everything that we do is interconnected. We're not divided beings. We don't live separate lives. We live one life. And that life flows from one activity into the next, into the next. When we finally realize that the way we do anything is the way we do everything, we have the power to change every aspect of our life. And it can all start with remembering to make your bed. Now let's go to prayer. As I move into that sacred place of communion, and I just lean into that knowing that God is right here, right now, everywhere, in everything, in everyone, in every circumstance and situation. No matter how it looks, God is and I am. For I know that I am always connected to the divine. That the only thing that's ever not connected is my awareness. So by simply bringing my awareness to it, I can feel that connection. I can be in that place of communion and feel that divine harmony and divine beauty that the universe offers to each of us. How wonderful it is to know that God has got all the challenges, no matter how things look. I like to remind myself, God has got this. And so I know that challenges, big or small, are always able to be managed and handled as long as I partner with spirit. Those difficult times when there's only one set of footprints in the sand, they're not my footprints. They're the footprints of spirit who's holding me. And I know that by beginning every day, I begin in that place of communion, in that place of spiritual practice. I begin with a habit that sets off a cascade of more and more and more habits, more tasks that all unfold to create a beautiful, successful experience of life. And not only do I know this for myself, I know this for each person here. And how grateful I am to not only know this in my mind, but to know this in my heart, to know this with every fiber of my being, that well begun is half done. And so it's with a heart so full of gratitude and so much love 
that I release my word to the law of mind, for I know that on the unseen side of life, it's already done. Spirit had said yes, and so it is. And so now together we say yes, and so it is. Amen. Doesn't Reverend Catherine seem to keep outdoing herself? What beautiful stories and quotes. We're so happy she could be with us once again. And since she ended with such a beautiful prayer, let me just take this time to remind you, if you feel like you've been inspired, please consider making a donation to our center. I'm so grateful for those who have diligently continued to support us and for all the contributions, which helped us to have special music, special ministers giving talks, and have our special events.